beloved, sacred, and sublime. Deacon Ra's comforting and consoling are the words of our text for today. Like, much like the words of the 23rd Psalm comes to us from the poetic pen of that shepherd, soldier, sovereign king David, this passage that falls from the lips of our Lord has for centuries, Uncle George, steadied many a struggling soldier, soothed many a troubled soul, and given hope to many a broken heart. When, if one were to stop to think about it, it, it may be, it may be that what makes these words that I did not just read you. I listened. I listened, Tracy, as Minister Vivian was, was reading them. You were so rude. You just took it from her. <laughs> she was trying to do her job as the assigned preacher to read the scripture. And while she trying to read it, y'all just was quoting it all over her. You know, you know Viv is, how shall I say, she's height challenged. <laughs> and so she has to work a little harder. <laughs> and y'all just snatch the scripture away from her. I listen. I stop quoting <laughs> confession. As I listen to you, I thought to myself, they really know that scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. You should have heard yourself saying it. And it may be, it may be deacons, it may be that the reason these words are so powerful, so potent, and mean so much to us is not just, I want you to hear what I'm going to say, Edmund, not just what they say, but who said them? And, Tanya, the circumstances under which they were said. It, it isn't just the words, it's who speaks the words. It, it, it isn't just who speaks them, it's the context in which those words are spoken. Uh, if you have a Bible, either in, you know, on paper or in, in, in your electronic device, uh, these are what we used to call red letter words. <laughs> these, are, these are the words of Jesus. And, and whenever, whenever I read them, whenever I quote them, almost every service of triumph we have in this church, these words are lifted at some point. And whenever I hear them, whenever I read them, whenever I quote them, I cannot help but think, Brother Lee Hinton, of the words of the late Dr. Gardner Calvin Taylor who said of this passage, Mambi, only if he is God does he have a right to say this to us. <laughs> only God, Dr. Taylor said, only God has the right to look at us and say to us, let not your heart be troubled. No man, no mortal, no woman, no matter what her position or prominence or power, no man, no matter what his rank or station or title has the right, the goal, the nerve to look at us and say to us, don't let 
your heart be troubled. Only God, especially Willie, when death has invaded the fields of our affection, robbed us of the form and the visage of one we love, only God has the right to walk into the pain of that moment and say to us, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, you can believe also in me. Lean forward. Let me talk to you. Lindy, if I said that, it would sound almost grossly insensitive, absurd. I look at you and your grief, your sorrow, your pain, and I say, oh, don't let that bother you. You would look at me and say, and what kind of nut is that? <laughs> but if he is God, <laughs> you missed it. If he is God, he has the right, no, no matter what comes our way, to look at us and say to us, don't let your heart be troubled. Now, Nicole, I have, over the years, I have said, and, and let me say this, and I'm not wrong either. <laughs> I have said over the years that um, an inference in this um, implication in this saying, let not your heart be troubled, uh, could suggest, Dr. Rudy Diggs, Runette Diggs, could suggest uh, that you and I have, uh, I, I will say this, please don't take this too far. That you and I have within us, within our, within our personhood, you and I have the right to determine what troubles us. <laughs> yeah, just look at a neighbor and say, I'm not going to let you trouble me today. You've been wanting to say that since Tuesday. Just, <laughs> I, I just blessed somebody's life so much. You've been wanting to say that since last January. I am. <laughs> Some parent been wanting to tell their child, I'm not going to let you trouble me today. Some wife been wanting to tell her husband, I'm not going to let you trouble me today. Somebody clearing your throat right now. You practice it so you can go to work tomorrow and look at somebody and say, I ain't going to let you trouble me today. You and I have, to a degree, Ricky, you and I have, to a degree, uh, we, we have a measure of authority and power, capability and possibility to not allow some stuff to trouble us. Yeah. Let not. you. Okay, here it is. You stop letting everything and everybody get under your skin. Can I preach and you won't be mad at me? Why do you let someone you'll never see again on 270 make you act unchristian? You are never going to see them again. And you fussing and cussing and flicking them the bird. And Sister Valeria Bush, they, you are never going to see, they never going to see you, you never going to see them, but now you've let them get under your skin and now you troubled. Why would you let somebody in line at Kroger trouble you? They got 18 items, they're supposed to have 15. Now, first of all, why are you counting? You really that bored? You one, two, three. Don't, Robin, don't let your heart be troubled. Th th this verse suggests, I've said it over the years, that, that you and I it inculcated within us, incorporate intuitively in us, is this latent power 
to determine what troubles us. But I think I've seen something else, another twist to it. Now, my first twist was right. Because I want him to teach me that all these years. Now he's saying it. No, it's still right. Stop letting petty, minor, minuscule, insignificant stuff trouble you. But there's something else, Goldine. There's something else. When I read this in various translations, looking at it in the original language, I saw something I've not seen before, which is why you never stop learning. Because there is a sense in which the tense of the text seems to suggest this. Are you ready? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Stop right there. There is a sense in which the tense of the text is, if you believe in me, you have no need for your heart to be troubled. <laughs> oh God, I missed y'all. Y'all missed it. Y'all, y'all missed that. That if that if you really okay, here it is. Here it is. If you really believe in me, not lip service, not not just cognitive reasoning, but if you truly believe, Deacon Angie, if you put all your faith in me and cast all your hope on me, you have no need for your heart to ever be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Uh, another way of looking at that, and we would do no harm to the text, it is not eisegesis, it is pure exegesis. We could add, why let your heart be troubled if you believe in me? Now, now, thank you, Larry. I miss you saying that. Keep in mind, beloved, when these words are spoken, keep in mind when they're spoken. They are spoken not long before the arrest of our Lord, not long before his crucifixion. And he has, in chapter 13, just told them, I am going away. Chapter 13, verse 33. Then he drops a bomb on him. One of you will betray me. That will mess up your whole day. Chapter 13, verse 21. And then he throws another bombshell in verses 37 through 38 of John 13 when he looks at Peter and says, I know you mean well, but before this night ends and before, before the rooster crows, you will deny me. That, 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 that's the context. Chapter 14 comes after chapter 13. In chapter 13, he is told that I'm going away. One of you will betray me. You will deny me. Look how quiet y'all getting. And then he comes to verse 1 of chapter 4, which is why I keep telling y'all, remember the chapters and the verses of the Bible are not sacred. After 41 years, whenever I say that, y'all look like you want to stone me. The chapters and verses of the Bible are not divinely inspired. They were put there by the translators. They were put there by those who worked on it. Uh, in fact, there were no chapters. Do you think Jesus was speaking in the, on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, 4, 5, and 6? And he's, okay, that's in there. Now, chapter 5, verse 1. Is that how you talk? Is that how you write a letter? Chapter 2. No. When Paul writes to Timothy and writes to Philemon and writes to Titus and writes to the churches of Asia, he doesn't write chapters. He's writing a letter. When Jesus is talking, he's not talking chapters. He's talking. Chapter 14 follows chapter 13. I'm going away. One of you will betray me. Peter, you will deny me. Let not your heart be troubled. Y'all missed it. All of that bad news. And 
then Jesus takes a breath and says, don't let your heart be troubled. It's as if Jesus knows, stay with me. You ready for this? Is this helping anybody? I, I'm not putting you to sleep, am I? Uh, you, you, you're, not, you're not taking Simonex while I'm preaching, right? It's as if Jesus says, life happens. Boy, it got real quiet. Life happens. Life happened to Jesus. Life happened to the disciples. Life happens to all of us. And often, Leland, it happens without warning. Can I get an amen? amen. But, somebody holler but. Thank God for the conjunction. Life happens, happens to all of us, happens without warning. But, God is with us. And that changes everything. And so these words, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. They speak powerfully to us, don't they? And if that were all, Pop, if that were all, that would be enough. I could run with that the rest of my life. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Deacon Tyson, I could run with that till Jesus comes, if that were all. But thank God there's more. Listen to what Jesus says. Don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because I go to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, I feel like preaching this, there you may be also. And then as if reading our mind, Jesus tells them and he tells us, in case you're wondering, in case you're not sure, in case you're tentative and unsettled, here it is, I am the way. <laughs> this word comes, Rudy, as an assurance, and it's an assurance of three things that anchor our lives today. I'm through. Here's the first one. I got to bless these motorcycles. Here's the first one. Jesus wants to assure them and us. Listen, church. Everybody say assurance. assurance. No, try it again. That wasn't good. Everybody say assurance. assurance. Online church, I can't see who y'all are. They got to print too small. Not my fault. <laughs> hi, Elder Snell. Hi, Erica. Hi, Nicole. I'm trying to see who I'm talking to. Sister Adrian Hodge, I, I, I'm saying hi. That's the last time because I can't strain my eyes but I'm glad to see all my online folk. This word comes as an assurance. Everybody say assurance. assurance. And it's an assurance of three things that you and I hold on to. Here's the first one. Jesus wants to assure them and us that though he will be absent, they nor will or we will be abandoned. I'm sorry, you didn't like that. Jesus assures us that though he is absent, we are not abandoned. Hmm. Look at verses 15 through 18. He has told them, I'm going away, and where I'm going, you cannot come now. No wonder they're discouraged. No wonder they're dismayed. Because one of the greatest fears, threats, phobias of life is that of abandonment of being left all alone, of being forsaken and forgotten. And so Jesus assures them and he assures us that will not happen to you. I may be absent, but you will not be abandoned. I'm, I'm waiting. I want that to settle on your spirit because some of you just this week have felt so utterly alone. Some of you the past few days have felt so utterly by yourself. 
Some of you, the last few days, have wondered, will I ever have the company of someone who I love and who loves me? Is the rest of my life consigned to loneliness or aloneness? I feel so alone. I feel so bereft. I feel so by myself. I feel abandoned. Good news, church. You are never abandoned. Okay, okay. It gets, it's going to get better. You are never by yourself. In fact, Jesus says in John 14, I will pray the Father and he will send you another comfort. The Holy Spirit. Or what the old sanctified folk call the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Three things. A, B, C. Write this down. He will be with them. This, 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 this parakletos, this one called alongside to help, will be with them. You, you, you have him with you. Oh, boy. No, he is with you right now. Well, of course, we're in church, on the drive home, in your apartment, in your house. At the doctor's office, in the lawyer's office, in the emergency room, wherever, on the unemployment line, wherever Sister Yvonne life takes you, he will be with you. Never alone. Never alone. He promised never to leave. Never leave me alone. He will be with you. But then watch this. Here's B. Not only will he be with you, he will be within you. <laughs> That's real good, Kathy. That's real good, Elder Lockhart. He, he's not just with me. He's within me. I'm going to try that one more time. He's not just with me. He's within me. I don't know why you're not shouting. You must be tired. He is not just with I, I mean, I'm glad he's with me. But I'm slap happy he's within me. That, that even when I don't sense him or see him or feel him, I do not go by my feelings or my emotion or my urges. I go by the confidence. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. He says, Mike, not only will he be with us, he will be within us. How many of you are saved? Just raise your hand. Don't be bragging. Just raise your hand. <laughs> Put your hand. Do, do, you, do you know who's in you? Yeah. Woo, Jesus. And you, Pablo, do you know the power that's in you? The dunamis that's in you, the exousia that is in you. But do you know more than that? Do you know the person that is inside you? The living Holy Spirit of the living God. How could you feel inferior with him in you? How could you be scared? With him in you, how could you be so tentative and timid with him in you? Would you confess right now online in the room, he is within me. He will be with us. He will be within us. Here, see, and he will watch over us. Uh, I, I, do, can I have three extra minutes? Because I have 15 minutes on the clock. Can I have three extra? I promise I'll give it back to you sometime before the end of the year. <laughs> do you remember Genesis 1 and 1? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That's John 1 and 1. And the word was with God. And the word was God. It parallels Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the space, face of the deep. Here it is. And the Spirit of God hovered, hovered, hovered over the face of the deep, over the abyss, over the darkness. 
over the void, over the chaos. Y'all still aren't with me. The Holy Spirit is not just with us. He is not just within us. He does what he did in creation. He hovers over us. Y'all didn't get it because I promise you'd be shocked. Over the pain and the darkness and the confusion and the sorrow and the hurt and the challenge and the difficulty of my life, he is hovering. I trust in God. I know he cares for me. On mountains peak or on the stormy sea, though billows roll, he keeps my soul, my heavenly father, watches over. So why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? Constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know. Not I hope, not I think, not I hypothesize. I know he watches over me. Well, here's the second point. Everyone say assurance. Jesus wants to assure them and us that prior preparation has already been made. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. This idea, Remnant, of place. Everybody say place runs throughout the Bible. It runs throughout the history of God's dealing with his people. God is always leading his people to a place. In the Old Testament, it's the promised land. In the New Testament, it's the Father's house. But the word, Uncle George, Deacon George, our Mary Sr., the word used here in the original language for place is the word topos. It's, it, it's, it's spelled just like it sounds, T O P dash O S, top O's. Uh, it, it's a Greek word for place. It's, it's the word that Jesus used. I go to prepare a top O's for you, <laughs> a place. A place. There are three things you can Kevin Newton about that. That Greek word. A, I love this one. It means a spot. <laughs> Jesus, it means a spot. Uh, sort of, kind of, sort of, like a specific space. Now look at me and stay holy. How many of y'all used to have a spot? <laughs> Goldine, look at me. Why are you looking down? <laughs> Come on, I know you saved it. You saved it now. <laughs> Nicole, no, I ain't going to bother you next to Daryl. Um, <laughs> Lee Hinton, you ever had a spot? <laughs> Online, y'all ain't getting off the hook. Y'all ever had a spot? You ever said, that's my spot. <laughs> <clears throat> It's, it's what that, that, that song y'all used to sing. We meet every day in the same cafe, 6.30. I know she'll be there. It's deacons, y'all don't know that. Just look ahead. Somebody holler, that was the spot. That was the spot. <laughs> Thank you, but chairman. Okay, come on. Jesus says, I am going to prepare a tapos, a place. It's a spot. Would you tell a neighbor, I got a spot? A specified space. Here's the next thing. It means selective. A is, it's a spot, the Greek word is spot, specified to topos. 
Uh, but then it also means selective. Now, here's what that means. Here's what that means. Selective means this really blessed me in my study. It's why I love working on sermons because I learn so much when I study. It, it literally means um, a, a selected place, but that selective place carries the idea of being limited as to who can come there. Ooh, everybody ain't going. Deacon Rosie Daddy done got mad now. No, no, I'm so sick of y'all on Facebook. Your cousin Puda die, heathen. Well, rest in peace. See you later. I don't want to see Puda. I don't know how to tell y'all this. Everybody you know is not going there. I know now y'all really mad. Y'all really mad, but I don't care. The pulpit has to preach the truth. We are sending folk to hell under a delusion. Heaven is a holy place filled with glory and with grace. And sin can never enter there. So if at the judgment bar, sinful spots, your soul should mar, you will never enter there. It is a spot, but it's selective. The Greek word is limited to who can go. You can't just drag everybody up in there. Heaven is a family reunion for folk in the family. Am I doing all right today? And then it's, it's C, it's secure. And that means safe, Helen. Listen, if it were not so, it, I, I wouldn't lie. I'm not blowing smoke up your pants leg. I'm, I'm not playing with you. If it were not so, I, I would not have told you. I would not have said it. I don't make empty promises. I do not give pious platitudes empty and devoid of fulfillment. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. I would tell you when you're dead, you're done. I would have told you live by the Epicurean philosophy Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die, and when we're dead, it's over. But that is not the case. Are you in the room with me? Well, here's, here's the third point. Y'all never been so glad to hear me say that in a long time. Here's the third point. Jesus wants to assure them and us deacons that there is no doubt of them arriving at their destination. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. Hallelujah. Receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, Thomas, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Let me let you in on my private time with God just for a moment. Last week, one day, I cannot remember what day it was, one day last week in my devotions, I read the words again found in Psalm 84, verses 6 and 7. These words, if you remember them or if you want to read them, speak of those, the Israelites, the Jewish people, who are making the pilgrimage. The Muslim, Muslims have Hajj. They make their way to Mecca. The Jews made pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And, and Psalm 84, verses 6 and 7 specifically, speak of those who are making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And this is what the psalmist said of them. When they walk through the valley of weeping, the King James calls it the valley of Baca, B-A-C-A. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rain will clothe it with blessing. 
they will continue to grow stronger and stronger. And each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. I wrote, I'm letting you in on my private time with God, my musings. I wrote in the margins of my devotional that morning these words. They made the journey. They arrived. Despite danger, delays, disruptions, and detours, they made it. I wrote to myself, they made it. They made it to Jerusalem. They made it to the temple. They made it to the worship. Even passing through the Valley of Baca. They had to go through the valley, Nina. But God turned the valley into a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rain filled the valley. Y'all didn't get it with blessings. Y'all, Dick and Dottie, they didn't get it. Have you ever found blessings in the valley? Jesus, have mercy. God, I wish I had half a church here. Have you ever been in a valley and found a blessing there? Have you ever been in a low place and found a blessing? Have you ever been in a dark and difficult place and there God showered blessing on you? Would you hunt your neighbor, say, I'm in the valley, but I'm picking up blessing. I'm walking through a place of sorrow. I'm in a place of weeping, but I'm picking up blessing. And the te- I feel this here, Deacon Rand. And the text says, and they go stronger. <laughs> because the valley will make you stronger. I wish I had a witness up in here. You don't grow by sipping lemonade on the beach. You don't grow by hanging out or by a jacuzzi. You grow in the gym of life where you lift weights and you pump weight and you pump iron and you got to do exercise. It makes you stronger. Would you turn to a neighbor and say, I'm getting stronger. I know you can't see it. I know you can't tell it, but I'm getting stronger because I I'm going through the valley and I'm going through the weeping but I'm getting stronger every day. Says they come through it and every one of them not one of them is lost. Not one of them dies on the journey. They all appear before God in Jerusalem. (laughs) That's what Jesus is really saying here in the text. Are you ready? Jesus is whispering to you right now. You will make it. Oh, I wish I had a church here. Did you just hear him whisper to you? You're going to make it. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I'll come back and get you. That where I am, you will be there. You are going to make it. Turn to a neighbor. Say, you're going to make it through hard times and hard trials, through storm and rain. Just tell a neighbor, you're going to make it. And if they don't seem interested, tell yourself, I'm going to make it. Weeping may endure for the night. Uh-uh, 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 I'm too old for that now. But joy comes in the morning. Somebody holler, I'm going to make it. Through the storm and through the rain, through the heartache and the pain, through sickness and sadness, I will make it. I'm determined. I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to stay with Jesus all the way. Jesus says you will make it. And there are three reasons why. First, because he says I've done the work. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I get it ready, when I finish the work, when I've done the major construction, I'm coming back to take you where I am. Because I've done 
done the work. Then he says, I've given you my word. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not the son of man that I should repent. If I said it, I will do it. Would you tell somebody you have his word on it? Would you tell another neighbor you have his word on it? If he said it, he will do it. I've done the work. I've given my word. And I will not stop or let you go until you walk into the city. You didn't hear what I said. He will not stop. And he won't let you go until that glorious day you step into the city. He won't let you fall. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. I feel like preaching. He will not let you go. He will not let you fall. He will not let you fail. He won't give up. He won't let go until you walk into the city just like John. Is there anybody here who's glad he won't let you go until you get to the city? He came the other day and got Obi to take her to the city. He came the other day and told O.O., are you ready to go? You lived in Columbus. You plan to move to Cleveland, but I've got another city not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, and he didn't let Obi go until she was ready to walk into the city. He's come back to First Church over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and taking us one by one but he didn't let them go until they were ready to walk in the city. And I got good news for you. I know you're struggling, and I know it gets hard, but he ain't going to let you go until you're ready to walk in the city. He's not going to stop working on you until you're ready to read your title clear. He's not going to give up on you until he's ready to change you from mortal to immortality, from corruptible to incorruption, from earthly to heavenly, from terrestrial to celestial. Somebody holler, he won't let me go until I'm ready to walk in the city. So walk together, children. Don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting over on the other side. And when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We're going to sing and shout. Do you have anybody over in that city? Anybody waiting on you? Anybody want to see you? Anybody you want to see? They can't crown him till we get there. 